said. As I said, I'm delighted to be here this evening to talk about the North American phalanx. I'm going to be pausing periodically. So if you have questions, you can use the chat function and I will answer them as succinctly and as concisely and as concretely as I can. Let me start with my background. As you've heard from Tom, I grew up in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. And after I did my graduate work in history, I found out that there was a utopian community in Perth Amboy called the Raritan Bay Union. It existed from 1853 to 1861, and it was located along the shores of the Raritan River south of the Route 1 Bridge as it crosses into Perth Amboy. In researching it and writing about it, I learned that it was an offshoot of the North American phalanx, which existed outside of Freehold from 1843 to 1855. So after I published an article in New Jersey history about the Raritan Bay Union, I gradually worked my way back to the North American phalanx. And this is what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Here's a picture on the left of the North American phalanx, which I'm going to call the NAP from now on. And on the right, you see a picture of the Raritan Bay Union. Um, sorry. Oops, sorry. I'd like to start by talking about communes in general. When we think of communes, we often think of hippies in the 1960s, but actually communes are very old in America and the golden age of American communes was not in the 1960s or 1970s, but before the Civil War. Before the Civil War, hundreds of communes were founded in New England, in the Middle Atlantic States, and in the Midwest. And later on in the century, communes were founded in the West. Here is a picture of probably the most famous of the communes, the United Society of Believers or the Shakers. They had about 4,500 members in 13 different communes by the time of the Civil War. Here's another picture of an upstate New York commune, the famous Oneida community. There are the communitarians on the front lawn of their major building. And on the right, you see their founder, John Humphrey Noyes, a very notorious and successful communitarian. Here is uh, a recreation of the New Harmony, Indiana commune, which is uh, historic and open to the public. These were communes that were inspired by the English industrialist, Robert Owen, and there were about 30 of them in the country. Now let's turn to the NAP. The NAP is part of an international movement of communes that was inspired by a man named Charles Fouillet, a Frenchman who lived from 1772 to 1837. When tourists come to the Montmartre Cemetery on the edge of Paris, they often visit the graves of people like Edgar Degas or Hector Berlioz or Francois Truffaut. Very few of them go to this grave site. This is Charles Fouillet's grave, and it's a picture that I took when I was at the cemetery. Fouillet is pretty unknown today, but in the 19th century, his writings inspired an international movement of communes. 
Here's a picture of what Fourier's ideal commune looked like. He called them phalanxes, which is a Greek word referring to uh, a military formation. Fourier was a strange man. He was a fussy, lonely bachelor. He liked parrots and collecting string, and he had very few friends and very little social life. He was uh, poor. He worked as a sales clerk and a traveling salesman, and his eccentricities were well known in his neighborhood. Children used to follow him around and shout, foo, 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 which in French means crazy. However, Fouillet had a very rich imaginative life. Over his lifetime, he wrote over 2 million words about what the coming society was going to look like. These have been collected and published in French in 12 volumes from 1966 to 1968. Fouillet believed that most people were unhappy because their passions did not have any outlet. He wanted to create an ideal society where people's passions could be realized and where they would be happy. And this kind of society was um, a commune of about 1,600 people. And the goal was harmony. He believed that if you organized a society correctly, people could exercise their pleasures and their freedoms and yet contribute to the benefit of the community. This sounds very fantastic to us, but in the 19th century, it was a very shining vision to many people from St. Petersburg, Russia, to Romania, to France, to Monmouth County, New Jersey. But Fouillet's movement wouldn't have come to Monmouth County, except for one man, Albert Brisbane, who lived from 1809 to 1890. Brisbane was a tall, pale, graceful, and slender man. He was very charismatic and energetic. He grew up in Western New York, and as a teenager, he convinced his wealthy father to send him to New York City to study French. He did, and then he went to Paris, studied there, and he met Charles Fouillet and became captivated by his philosophy. He paid Fouillet to give him lessons in his phalanx philosophy. And then he came back to America in 1834 to propagate Fouilletism. For a couple of years, he used his money to invest because he wanted to make a lot of money in order to create the ideal Fouilletist phalanx. But the depression of 1837 crashed his hopes. He lost a lot of money. And then he decided that the only way to develop Fouilletism in America was to undertake a reform campaign. And so for decades, he wrote articles, published books, lectured, and talked about Fourierism. But he soon found that Fourier had a very mixed reputation in America. And so we stopped using his name. And instead, the followers of Fourier called themselves associationists. And they took Fourier's philosophy and they Americanized it. For example, Fourier did not have any families in his ideal phalanx. But of course, this was very radical and controversial in America. And so Brisbane argued that you could have families and have a successful commune at the same time. And while they talked about passion, they downplayed passion because it sounded suspicious to Americans. And instead they talked about how the American phalanx would be a planned community of men and women where people pool their money and their resources 
and they work together to build a better life. <clears throat> Here is a picture from one of uh, Brisbane's books about what the ideal phalanx would look like. As you can see, he was following Fourier very closely. This is a huge structure with many floors and uh, beautiful gardens and many outbuildings. In the late 1830s, associationism caught on in America and over time, about 30 communes were founded. As you can see, the golden years were 1843, 1844, and 1845. New York led the nation with eight, and Ohio with five. The commune on the left is from Wisconsin, and the picture on the right is famous Brook Farm outside of Boston. It didn't start as a associationist commune, but it turned into one. One of its most famous residents was Nathaniel Hawthorne, who later wrote a satirical novel about Brook Farm called The Blythedale Romance. However, something happened. Most of the associations collapsed. They didn't last longer than six months or a year. And they collapsed for very obvious reasons. Most of them were underfinanced. Many of their sites were not good. They had real estate problems. They were terribly mismanaged. They had poor governance and internal organization. And there was no national society to organize all these communes and link them together. But what Brisbane and others didn't really understand is that one of the reasons why associationism didn't do well is because of its doctrines. Brisbane and others argued that if people followed associationism, the communes would quickly succeed. They would be wealthy and they would attract a lot of people. When that didn't happen, people left them and they said that the doctrines of associationism were not valid. However, there was one commune that went against the grain, and that is the North American phalanx outside of Freehold, New Jersey. So now we're going to look at the NAP and try to figure out why it was a success when all the other communes failed and learn something about communitarianism in 19th century America. The NAP did not begin in Monmouth County. It began in Albany, New York. And the two founders were Charles Sears, who was a corn merchant, and John Buckland, who was the brother-in-law of Sears and a merchant. We have no pictures of Sears or Buckland and only two descriptions of them. Buckland is described as a quiet, serious person and Sears is the opposite. He's described as a very vivacious, outgoing person. So together, these two men and their wives, Gertrude Sears and Lydia Buckland, founded the NAP and kept it going from 1843 to 1855. Brisbane was trying to create a giant phalanx along the same size and lines of Fourier. And so they organized an Albany branch of the North American phalanx and began getting members and collecting money. But what they found is that they were the only branch. There were no other branches who were interested in founding a new phalanx. So with their money, they searched around the Northeast and they found a 673 acre farm outside Freehold. And they bought it in July of 1843 for $14,000. So this is the beginnings of the NAP. And as you can see from this quote, Sears was quite excited and like Buckland and others believed that associationism was something very inspiring and worth trying. Here's a map of the NAP 
from 1855 when it was sold. And I'm going to orient you to the NAP here. The road in the middle that you see is today's Phalanx Road. And that's named, of course, after the NAP. The river to the right is the Swimming River, which is now the Swimming River Reservoir. The buildings of the NAP, if you can look at this, uh, it's a little small, are right to the north of Phalanx Road and the farming fields and the forest are to the south. <clears throat> Later on, I'm going to talk about the afterlife of the NAP, what happened to its members and its uh, property after 1855. But right now, I just wanted to orient you toward uh, the NAP so you can see where it is. It's about 10 miles outside of Freehold. And if you drive down Phalanx Road, you will see the sign, which is right at the site of most of the major buildings. It's sort of accurate, as we'll see later on. Like most historical markers, it's uh, not always as uh, factually correct as it could be. OK. I'm going to stop for a moment and uh, see if there are any questions that people have. And uh, now my challenge is I don't see my chat button anymore. Jamie, if you hover on the bottom of your screen, I believe you'll see it. Yes, I'm hovering and uh, unfortunately I don't see it. You might have to, it might hover near the top. Well, I'm doing that. I mean, I see my toolbar at the top, but I don't see any chat. All right. Uh, I can read it. There's one question. I can read it to you if you don't mind. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Okay. From the contemporary paintings of the day, it looks like what was in front of the buildings and is now Phalanx Road was part of the present day reservoir. How has the topography of the immediate area been altered since the phalanx was in operation? Okay, that's a good question. The reservoir is the eastern end of the property of the NAP. The only part of the topography of the NAP that still remains is Trout Brook. Trout Brook runs parallel to Phalanx Road on the northern side. And what the NAP did is that they dammed Trout Brook and created a, built a grist mill. And they also built a swimming pool. <laughs> and uh, Trout Brook is not as big as it used to be, but it's still there. The rest of the property today is all houses and as we will see, there's only one structure that comes from the NAP that is uh, still surviving today, and it's a private house. Okay, if there, uh, well, I think there's another question. No, nope, I just see one question right now. If okay, anybody else has any good. others, please feel free to enter one in. Okay, good, thank you. So we have to ask ourselves the question, why did the NAP get off to such a good start? Why did they have a good first year compared to all the other communes, which usually fell apart within a year? First of all, Buckland and Sears were successful businessmen. They understood how to organize and run an organization. They looked around and they learned from the mistakes of the other foyerist communes, which were being written about in uh, associationist publications and also in newspapers. So they learned from the mistakes of those around them. Also, Sears, because he was in Albany, visited a nearby Shaker commune where he was given a very detailed tour and learned about how the Shakers had built their successful commune. 
also um, distinct from these other communes that fell apart, the NAP was very careful about controlling membership. To join the NAP in its first year, you had to apply and you had to show two things. You had to have a skill like carpentry or, or and or you had to have money. They wanted investors because they realized they would need money to get them through the first year. And lastly, by developing the Albany branch of the North American phalanx, the NAP created what I would call bonds of community. They had a collectivist democratic organization where people voted and held office. They got investors. And when they moved to Freehold or outside of Freehold, it was tough in the first couple of months. They were living in the old Van Meter buildings. And so they practiced mild forms of renunciation which gave them a common bond and a hope for the future. So the NAP got off to a very good start compared to most other foyerist communes or associationist communes. Now I'd like to look at how they built the NAP and we're gonna look at some of the buildings. As you can see, Foyer had a vision of the phalanx that was fantastic. Phalanxes would be miles in size. They would have 1,600 people and they would be very well endowed. Brisbane had a more modest vision, but he also believed that a large phalanx was more likely to succeed. Problem is they couldn't find the people and the money to do it. The NAP's vision of the phalanx is nicely summarized by Charles Sears in this quotation. New social institutions, new forms into which the life of the people shall flow cannot be determined by merely external conditions and the elaboration of a theory of life and organization, but are matters of growth. In other words, Sears and his colleagues understood that you couldn't build a commune with 1600 people. You had to start small, work with the money and the people you had and organically develop it. And so that's what they did. Here's their first building. This was built in 1844 and it was an office, a library and family suites on the first floor, family suites on the second floor and there was a dormitory room on the third floor for single residents, most of whom were younger people. You'll be very happy to learn that nothing changes very much. When visitors came to these communal buildings, they always commented that all the young people threw their clothes on the floor. In the back of this building, they built something called a serastery, which is a, a foyerist word. And this served as the NAP's manufacturing center. The NAP uh, bottled a lot of fruits and vegetables. And by bottled, I mean they literally preserved them in bottles and they shipped them to New York City for sale. And so this was their manufacturing center. As the NAP grew and as associationism declined, the NAP started reaching out and asking people to invest in order to build a large phalanstery, which is what the main buildings were called in associationism and foyerism. And this is a photograph, probably taken about 1970, of the NAP's phalanstery which was dedicated on May 6, 1851. Here's another view. Here are some interiors. And as you can see, there were different sized apartments for single people, married people with children and married couples without children.
And this is what it looked like around 1855. You can see the phalanstery in the background, and you can see the first uh, communitarian building in the foreground, and some of the von Meter buildings that are being used as offices in the front. And you see Trout Brook, which is dammed there, and there's a swimming pool, and there is a diving board. If you look carefully, uh, you'll see that this was the old swimming hole for the NAP. And you'll notice that in the far right of the picture, there is a freestanding house. And that is the house built by Marcus and Rebecca Spring. And this is my picture of it. It is still on the site of the phalanx and it is now a private residence. Now the NAP did something very creative when they built their structures. They wanted to create a society with a small private realm and a large public realm. So the apartments were small and people spent most of their time in public. There was a common dining room, there was a library, there was a parlor, and of course they had all the fields and buildings where people worked. They also beautified the environment by planting shrubs and flowers and trees. And they created an interesting material culture. I interviewed an archeologist from Douglas College who with his students had done some archeological work at the NAP. And he found a couple of interesting things in the two pits that his students dug. First of all, there was a huge amount of shellfish shells that they found in the garbage pits. So obviously the NAP was getting a lot of its food from Raritan Bay in the form of shellfish. The other thing that they found in the garbage pits was that the early or the bottom parts of the pits had china and individualized silverware and goods. But the upper parts of the pits, the more recent parts, had simple earthware, earthenware, and simple forks, knives, and spoons, and other goods. In other words, the NAP had moved from individualized possessions to more uniform, simplified, standardized possessions. And lastly, the archeologist told me that he was shocked at how tidy the garbage pits were. And that tells you that the NAP was interested in planning and regulating its environment very, <clears throat> excuse me, very carefully. They believed that architecture and the environment were very important and they wanted to use it to promote a collective identity. So of all the associationist communes, the NAP had the largest structures and the kinds of structures that promoted associationism. For example, none of the apartments had kitchens. Everyone ate in a common dining hall. That was true of babies, children, and adults. So we have shrinking the private realm and enlarging the public realm on the grounds as a result of the kind of environment they created. Well, before I go on, I'm going to stop and see if there are any more questions. Not yet. Okay, I must be answering all the questions that are <laughs> popping into your mind. It's incredible how clairvoyant you can be. But please feel free to ask questions. Now you're probably wondering what kind of political economy the NAP had. In other words, what was their political structure what was their economic structure and how did the two interact? 
A good way of thinking about this is to look at their currency. The NAP printed their own money for use on the grounds. And they had eight phrases that they put on the borders of the currency. And if you read these eight phrases, you will get the political economy of the NAP in summary. I will be going over some of these as we go through the slides, but if you have any questions about them, I'll be glad to answer them. Here is the NAP's governing structure. You had stockholders who received one vote per share. Stockholders could be residents of the NAP or simply investors in the NAP. The more stock you had, the more votes you got. Resident members got one vote per resident. And not everyone who lived in the, on the grounds was a member. Many of them uh, tried it and left. Um, there weren't a lot of members. In 1850, according to the US Census, there were 125 people on the grounds and probably less than half of them were members. So the stockholders and the members elected an executive council and in turn, the executive council created a council of award, which determined the hourly rates for work and the series and groups, which I will explain in a moment. Men and women were eligible to vote and eligible to serve. Most of the people on the executive council were men, but there were women who uh, were elected and there were women who served on the Council of Award and in the series and groups. So this is the way the NAP ran itself. It was democratic, but it was also based on the power of investors because both Brisbane and Fouillet were not communists. They weren't even socialists. They believed that investing was a very valuable way to build up uh, society and build up the associations. And so stockholders had a lot of power. In Fourier's ideal phalanx, he divided work into series and groups. And so the NAP also divided its work into series and groups. All the wage rates were democratically determined. In other words, the executive council, along with the council of award and the series and groups figured out how much people should earn per hour. Also the series and groups elected their own leaders. The stockholders and residents, as I mentioned, elected the executive council. Based on Fourier's principles, they paid the highest hourly rates for the most repulsive work. And uh, an example is the manure group. You could make lots of money shoveling manure all day if that's what you wanted to do. The lowest pay was for the easier tasks, such as uh, the sewing group or waiting on tables in the common dining hall. The residents received credit for their work. Every Sunday night, Charles Sears posted series and groups assignments outside the dining hall. You could choose which series and groups you wanted to work in. There was an account book as you entered the door to the dining hall and people wrote down their series and groups and how many hours they work per day. Since it was an open book, it was also open to inspection. And so everyone was scrupulously honest. So you earned money for your work 
And then at the end of the month, you received a bill from the phalanx for your food and for your shelter. Most of the people in the phalanx worked in agriculture. There also was a grist mill once Trout Brook was dammed. And as you know, they canned vegetables, but agriculture was their major uh, occupation or income. And here's how it worked. There were four series, agriculture, manufacturing, the domestic series and livestock. The largest group was agriculture and the uh, largest, well, the largest series was uh, farming and agriculture, teamsters in manufacturing, cooking in the domestic and milking in livestock. In 1848, they had 248 acres under cultivation, mostly corn and wheat. The uh, Von Mader farm had 120 acres under cultivation, but the soil was very exhausted because it was a, uh, a slave plantation and they had uh, been very inefficient in their farming. However, one of the reasons why the NAP bought the land is because it had marl <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Which is a uh, calcium carbonate that's used for fertilizer. So they use manure and marl in order to regenerate the soil. And they sold a lot of their produce locally and in New York City. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's an example of their orchards in 1848. The NAP believed it was creating an alternative to American society. They considered American society to be doomed. There was too much poverty, too much inequality, too much financial chicanery. And they believed that capital along with businesses were developing a new feudalism in America. So they created at the NAP a different kind of economy. They focused on choice, variety, and workplace democracy. They promoted the public interest, and they rewarded people based on their investment in work. In the early years of the NAP, the dividends for investment were very low, but they got better. And on average, they were about 5.2% a year, which is a pretty good return on investment. Visitors who came to the NAP were very impressed. One of the most famous visitors to the NAP was Frederick Law Olmsted. He was the designer of Central Park in New York City, and he was also a reformer in addition to being a pioneering landscape architect. He visited the NAP in 1852 and wrote a long article about it for the New York Tribune, a newspaper founded by Horace Greeley, who was one of the major investors in the NAP. And as you can see, Olmsted was very impressed by the NAP and his comments were not unusual. A lot of visitors came to the NAP and they were impressed by how well organized it was and how thoughtful and caring the people were. And here's a quote from one of the main uh, leaders of the NAP in 1852. And it basically summarizes how the NAP saw itself. They did not want to trod any man underfoot. Now you're probably wondering, what about women at the NAP? I will tell you that the chapter I wrote about women at the NAP was the most difficult chapter of the book. 
<coughs> excuse me, because the women had a real problem at the NAP. While they were integrated in the public realm and they could vote and serve on committees, they had two jobs. They were running their households and they were working in the groups and series. <coughs> so uh, while the NAP wanted to challenge the subordination of women, this was very difficult to do. At the NAP, women were so enthused about the new kind of society they were creating that they dressed in bloomer costumes. And here's a picture of one. The bloomer costume was named after Amelia Bloomer, and it was very popular among feminists in the 19th century. It was a dress with pants, and it enabled women to move around more freely and not worry about their modesty. Almost all the women at the NAP wore bloomer costumes, but when they went in the freehold, they found that it was too scandalous. So they dressed in their traditional clothes when they went outside the community. In pre-Civil War America, women earned about 0.3 percent of what men earned for the same positions. At the NAP, it was 0.67 percent. Now, this still may seem very low to you, but I want to point out that American female wage earners achieved 0.67 percent in 1990. So the NAP was actually paying women much better than most places in the mid 19th century, and in fact, most places in the mid 20th century. But the women had a problem. First of all, as I mentioned, they uh, had to do their household cleaning and take care of the kids and also work in the group in series. And Middle-class women in 19th century America always had servants in their houses. In 1850, New York City had 30,000 families and there were 12,000 servants. Being a servant was probably the most popular occupation in 19th century America. But there were no servants at the NAP. Of course, that would have gone against their philosophy. So women had two jobs home and work. Let me quote to you from Gertrude Sears, Charles Sears's wife. <coughs> In uh, 1848, they received a letter from the Boston Union of Associationists, gently chiding them for not being feminist enough. And this is how Gertrude Sears replied. When it is considered that we had not the advantage of any central influence, any directing mind or natural leader, and especially in our domestic departments, no one to whom we could look as authority, you may readily imagine that last summer, when for the first time, we had anything like adequate force in our domestic departments, a long arrear of unfulfilled family and personal obligations remained. Also, that from the combined influence of exhausting labor and destructive antagonism, a brief repose would not be unwelcome. In other words, the NAP's women had to do three things. They had to take care of their families, they had to work in the group in series, and they participated in the phalanx's political life. That's the reference to destructive antagonism. That's a good uh, mid 19th century description of politics for today. And so Gertrude Sears understood that 
once the association has decided to keep the nuclear family, women would have two responsibilities and it was very, very demanding. Here's what another visitor said about the women at the NAP. She wrote that it was, quote, beautiful and affecting to hear what fatigue and labor the women subjected themselves to. Women who have been but little accustomed to anything of this kind, how steadfastly and with what noble courage they endured it. We should keep in mind that very few women worked after they got married in the 19th century. The women who worked were poor women, uh, indigenous women, and enslaved African Americans. So when these women came to the NAP, they had to do a few things that they had never done before. They had to work for a living and they had to manage their houses, however small they were, these apartments, without any servants. And so this was very, very challenging for them. And uh, yeah, it made life difficult. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. And uh, Tom, are there any other questions? Yeah, we got a number of them actually. Okay, could you read them? Sure, so the first Thank one you. is, what is the meaning of renunciation? It means giving something up. Next I, question. I think, yeah, I think in terms of the phalanx, I think you had mentioned they had oh, renunciation. Yes, what, what I what mean, mean is there? that when the phalanx was first formed, People had to live in very cramped, modest quarters and work very hard to restore the buildings and the grounds. And that was a form of renunciation. And by doing it together, they developed bonds of friendship and trust and a belief that the future would be better than the present. Okay. Next question. At the time of the fire in the 1970s, who owned the property on which the main building stood and was there interest in preserving it at that time? Good question. That's one of my slides that are coming up. So I'll leave it you in suspense for now. Okay, next question. Did the one vote per share tilt control of governance to the stockholders? Would you read that again, Tom? Did the one vote per share tilt control of governance to the yes. stockholders. The wealthiest people ran the NAP and that's the way they wanted it. They believe that people who invested the most money should have the most say. So working people okay. might've contributed 25 or $50 and had one or two shares. People like Charles Sears had three or $400 invested in the NAP and had more votes. Next question. Okay. Who would be interested in living in a community where lives could be controlled by non-resident stockholders? Well, most of us are living lives where uh, major decisions are being made by banks and industries that are out of our control. This is uh, no different. And while some of the residents grumbled about the power of stockholders. They understood that without investment, the NAP could not continue to grow and thrive. So while there was political dissension, there was never any revolt of uh, small stockholders against the large stockholders, even though they did complain about what you've just described. Hmm. Okay. Did the NAP pay taxes to the state or county? Yes, they did. Although taxes were very low then, the NAP became a very respected institution in Monmouth County. Sears and Buckland and a few other people served on what today we would call the Board of Education. And they were active in town affairs and they did pay uh, what little taxes there were, yes. They were not a nonprofit organization. Okay. Next question is about the geography of the group. Um, do you happen to have maybe a map, an overlay of where 
it was situated as to uh, the geography of today? Well, that map I showed you from 1855 is a good map. It shows that the NAP was just to the west of the Swimming River Reservoir, north and south of Phalanx Road. Okay. And uh, where is that historical sign that you showed? Do you know where exactly that is? Yes, it's right at the site of the NAP buildings on the north side of Phalanx Road. Okay, got a couple more questions. Do you want to continue or do you want to? No, I'd like to answer the questions. Questions are good. Okay, were there any religious or spiritual underpinnings to the philosophy? Well, we're going to see in a moment that there were some religious disputes at the NAP. The NAP respected religion, but didn't promote it in any way. And uh, some of the religious people on the property uh, hoped that one day there would be ministers and church services there, but there were not. Okay. Now, would there were be- many communes that were religious in orientation. But uh, associationism was not. It had a, a, a god. The god was Charles Fourier, and uh, his prophet was Albert Brisbane. Would this be uh, considered to be a form of, of a utopian society? It is a utopian society. The word utopia comes from a novel by Thomas More, a minister of Henry VIII. And utopia is a play on the Latin word for nowhere. So all of these societies that I've been talking about can be called utopian communities. Yes. Okay. And are there any personal memoirs of the Phalanx descendants about what their childhood were like growing up in the community? Uh, I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. It's a good question. But unfortunately, there's not a lot because most of the documentation we have about the NAP is kind of official documentation. It's account books, it's meeting books, it's real estate records and things like that. The people at the NAP were not intellectuals. They were middle class and working class people. And uh, they didn't write diaries and they didn't write books about their experience, unfortunately. Although I'm gonna talk about a few who did uh, later on. Okay, and I think this is the last question for right now. There's a historic schoolhouse on the corner of Phalanx Road and Laird Road. Was that part of the NAP? No, it was not. The NAP did not have a separate school building, but they did have uh, an education program. It was... uh, part of their uh, integrated education, as they called it, although they had problems uh, with it, as I'm going to explain in a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Now, although the NAP was doing well, in the uh, 1850s, it began to have problems, and I will briefly talk about them. One problem is a problem that all communes have, and that's the difficulty in attracting people who want to stay there. The Shakers estimated that only about one out of 10 people who joined the community ever became members. And with the NAP, also it's about a 10 to one ratio. So during the life of the NAP, probably a thousand people lived on the property, but only about one out of 10 became members. And so that was a problem. They needed to find people who were committed. They also had an unusual demographic profile. I compared the NAP from the census of 1850 to the US census of 1850. And I found some odd things. The NAP had very few single women, had a high medium age compared to the rest of the United States, and had a low proportion of children to adults. It also had difficulty in attracting investors. 
once the community was established, the people living on the grounds were able to support themselves, but they didn't make enough money to invest in the community. But the big problem was that the Fourierist movement, the, associ the associationist movement was declining. And so by the early 1850s, they were the only commune left that was an associationist commune. So many people in the community started wondering, what is the future? There's no movement anymore. We are by ourselves. And so they began uh, wondering what they should do. In 1853, a group of wealthy investors who were mostly uh, upper middle class left the NAP and started the Raritan Bay Union in Perth Amboy. And so they took about 50 people with them and all their money. So that was a real blow to the NAP. And then in 1854, there was a fire that destroyed 2,000 bushels of wheat and corn in several buildings. The NAP had insured everything, but when they tried to collect from the Mohawk Insurance Company, the company could not pay and simply declared bankruptcy. So they lost all of that. So finally in 1855, they dissolved the NAP and they did it on October 3rd by selling the land and property through an auction to about 200 people totaling $56,000. And as you can see, Charles Sears was very uh, traumatized by the sale as were many of the members. However, the NAP has an afterlife. It lasts over a century. And so I'd like to briefly talk about how the NAP continued. Interestingly, about 50 people continued living at the NAP after the community ended. The women still wore bloomer clothes and Buckland became one of the leaders of the community and the uh, property started to look good again. Here's the philanstery in 1900. One of its most famous members was Alexander Walcott, who was John Buckland's grandson. He was raised on the grounds and wrote a little bit about his childhood, but not much. Edmund Wilson from Red Bank, New Jersey, the great 20th century man of letters, kept prodding Walcott to write a memoir of his life at the NAP growing up, but he never did. And so that was very unfortunate. <clears throat> the last original member of the NAP was Lydia Buckland, and she died at the philanstery at the age of 84 on, in 1902. And as you can see, to her dying day, she believed that the principles of the NAP were still valid. Charles Sears had an interesting afterlife. He stayed on the grounds for a couple of years and liquidated all the debts. And then he moved out to Kansas. And at the age of 60, he joined a new foyerist community called the Kansas Cooperative Farm. It raised silk and he became the supervisor of the community silk industry along with his kids. And this was the last Fouillerist commune in the United States. Here's a picture of the philanstery in Kansas. It's about 30 miles from Manhattan, Kansas. And on the right is the cocoonery. <clears throat> The grounds of the Kansas Cooperative Farm are now a farm. And I was out there and interviewed the farmers who certainly knew about its history. And they showed me the remaining buildings. And uh, here's a picture I took of the cocoonery. Sears ran a very successful 
Kansas Cooperative Farm. And he wrote a short book about the NAP. However, in the late 1880s, in the uh, economic move that you should find familiar, cheap Chinese silk entered the United States, undercut the Kansas Cooperative Farm, and drove it out of business. <clears throat> the philanthropy, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, survived until 1916. And here's what Sears had to say in his old age. In other words, like Lydia Buckland, Sears lived and died a communitarian. Now, someone had asked about the grounds. So let me say a few words about that. The philanstery was still there. It became a hotel. It was a boarding house and a school. In 1972, the property was sold for new construction. They were going to tear down everything and build houses. Locals got worried and finally realized the uh, importance of the philanstery as a historic structure, and they created a Save the Phalanx Committee. They wanted to buy the building and create an art center and a history center there in the building. However, on November 14, 1972, a fire destroyed the building, probably set by homeless people who were living in the building. So today, the area of the NAP is all tasteful private homes. Streets are named after Brisbane and Greeley and other NAPers, and nothing remains of the NAP <clears throat> except for the Spring House, which you already saw. Now, you might be asking, what is the relevance of the NAP? It's important, obviously, because of its historic value, but I think it has another importance. If we were to visit the NAP in 1850 and sit down with Gertrude and Charles Sears and Lydia and John Buckland, our vocabulary would be different and our ways of expressing ourselves would be different, but I don't think they would have any problem understanding us. And if we discussed the political, economic, and social problems that we have in our country today, they would understand them because the associationists wrote about all these things over 150 years ago. It's easy to make fun of people like Fouillet in Brisbane, and it's easy to scratch your head about the NAP and consider people like Sears and Buckland to be misplaced idealists. But they were very thoughtful people and they had a vision of a better society. And it's the kind of society that we are still arguing about today. In uh, one of his novels, William Faulkner said that the past is not dead. It isn't even past. And I would say the same thing about the NAP. The NAP challenges us today because they raised a number of issues that are still very important and very current in American society. And so with that, I will stop. And uh, if there are any more questions, I will be glad to answer them. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Go right uh, ahead, Tom. This one asks, what year were the height of the NAP and how many people were uh, actual residents? In the census of 1850, there were 125 residents. Members, there were probably less than half. Like most communes, the NAP had a core of leaders and people who lived on the grounds and then people who tried out associationism for a couple months didn't like it and left. And so uh, 
I would say that over the life of the commune, there were probably a thousand people who lived on the grounds of the NAP. I think their best years were probably from about 1848 to about 1853. Even if they didn't have a fire, I think the NAP would have fallen apart because the movement was falling apart. And without the movement, there was no reason for the NAP to exist. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Tom? Yes. Uh, what was the reason for not being enough children in the NAP? The problem was economic. Because you were charged uh, rent for your apartment and charge for your food, people with big families had more expenses. For example, I had read to you that affecting letter from Gertrude Ste Sears about all the work she and other women had done. In 1848, when she wrote that letter, she had six children ages birth through 14. And she was working and managing a family and participating in the NAP's political life at the same time. So I think the NAP discouraged families because they realized that it was very difficult to make a go of it with a lot of children. Okay. What was the relationship between the phalanx and the local community like? It was a good relationship. They were respected and they participated in county affairs. There were never any problems between the commune and the county. And many locals used a grist mill to ground their flour or their grain, which was an important source of income for the NAP. So the NAP was a good neighbor, well behaved, and uh, they avoided any scandals. So they uh, got along well with the people in the neighborhood. Okay. You had mentioned that a number of people stayed at the commune but didn't become actual residents. Uh, why did those people not end up staying? Well, it's hard to figure out, but obviously they came there thinking that this may be the kind of life for them. And what they found, obviously, is that communitarian life was either uh, lack, lack privacy, or they couldn't make enough money, or they didn't like the people there. You know, it's hard to say, but uh, all over the country in the 19th century, hundreds of thousands of people tried communal life, but most of them only stayed a couple of months. They realized it wasn't for them. Okay. We have a question here. Uh, you had mentioned the Raritan Bay Union. Um, yes. Have you done any uh, more, any studies on them or published any works about them? Or do you want to say anything else about them tonight? Well, that's a separate talk. The Raritan Bay Union was created, as you know, as an offshoot of the NAP. And it was not an association. It did not follow the principles of Charles Fourier. What it emphasized is education and culture, which the secessionists believe was lacking at the NAP. One of the challenges at the NAP is that you had highly educated, fairly wealthy, middle-class people living with working-class people. And then as today, uh, that is difficult to do. And so the... Uh, Raritan Bay Union was formed as a kind of counterpose to the NAP. And with its focus on the arts and education, it tried to uh, provide its residents with something that they thought was missing at the NAP. There were a lot of artists and uh, well-known intellectuals who lived at the RBU. I'll just give you some examples. Um, Theodore Well, the abolitionist lived there. The Grimka sisters, famous women's rights and abolitionists also live there. George Innes, the New Jersey artist, lived there for a time. And Louis Tiffany of Tiffany Glass fame lived there for a while. These people would not have liked to live at the NAP, but they were willing to live at the RBU because it was a different kind of place. 
Interesting. Uh, we have one more question I see. How did associationist communes differ from the utopian socialist communities inspired by Robert Owen? Okay, that's a good question. Robert Owen was an, Indo an English industrialist who wanted to create a communitarian movement and a cooperative movement. And he started in England, but his ideas caught on in the United States. His communes were more socialistic than the NAP and the associationists. And not one of his communes succeeded for very long. I mean, if the NAP was uh, the most successful Foyer's commune, it was far more successful than all the uh, Owenite communities put together. Uh, Owen believed that people were molded by their environment. And he thought that by creating a socialist communitarian environment, he could change people. But of course, it's more difficult than that. So the Owenite communities had many of the same problems as the associationist communes. Poor, no investors, poor leadership, things like that. And they fell apart very quickly, but they were different. But Owen was uh, far more respected than Charles Fouillet. Okay, uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to cover tonight? I would like to say thank you to everyone who has been with me tonight. It's been very enjoyable for me to talk about the NAP. Uh, I've spent many years studying the NAP and it's great to get back to it by putting together this talk. So I thank you for your support and your cooperation. And I thank Tom and the members of the Middletown Historical Society for inviting me. And thank you for uh, coming on and giving this presentation. It was quite edifying. I think everybody would agree on that. All right, everybody, uh, we will post this video on our YouTube channel. So you can uh, review it there if you'd like. And if you'd like any additional info on the Historical Society, please visit us at middletownnjhistory.org and keep your eyes open for our uh, next invitation for our next speaker to be on June 21st. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a good night.